Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I started going to B&H uh, in the late 70s or early 80s and when they were on 17th Street. So to be standing here after so many years talking to you is, is an honor um, to, uh, to do this presentation for you. Um, the title of the presentation is called In Process. And the reason that I, I called it In Process is I've really modeled my career uh, on that subject. Um, everything sort of morphs, changes. I'm always looking, I'm always exploring, I'm always trying new things. I never really want to get stuck into one sort of genre. Um, so I think you'll, you'll see from where I began and from uh, where, where I'm doing now that there's a trajectory, trajectory and um, one that I hope uh, you'll understand. Before I get into all of that, I do want to talk about a book that I recently published. It came out in April with Powerhouse Books. Um, you'll see from the dates that it's a 20-year group of work. Um, I, it came to, this is one of those situations that came to me. I wasn't thinking about taking photographs of children. Uh, I got a commission one day, and um, I had photographed this woman's older daughter, and it was a typical nice, commissioned photograph, and then she commissioned me for her second daughter on her first birthday. And when I looked at that picture here, there was something very different about it. Um, and it struck me, and it struck me to think about why. And I realized that the picture that I was looking at really didn't look like a baby at all. It was a, a, a real person, and whose personality had developed, and um, I was struck by that, and sub sub subsequently, um, by word of mouth, I got another commission, and I approached it the same way. And you'll see, and I, I put this up just to show you, and this is the photography community, that um, the lighting is so simple. I mean, it can't really be any simpler. I have a strobe, and I have a black card on either side, and the child sits in a, a little chair, white seamless, and I've kept that consistent for 20 years. And the reason I did that is because I didn't want the elements of the photographic process to be involved in the portraiture at all. Um, this child sits on a, a white cloth, obviously for to have some bounce into the, uh, under the chin to give some fill. This is the picture that resulted from that. Um, um, after 20 years, um, I decided that I wanted to do a book. The idea of doing a book had started in my mind probably five or six years previous to that. And uh, lo and behold, um, I found out my wife was pregnant and I was gonna have a child of my own and it just seemed like the right time to sort of pull this together. So I went to Powerhouse Books and I owe them a uh, debt of gratitude. Um, they agreed to do the book, and I couldn't be happier with the publication. I do hope you take some time when we're done here to take a look at the book. I think it's a beautiful design book, a design team of Ludique, Fred, and uh, Daniel, who I don't think are here today, um, designed the book. And I was very, very blessed to have really wonderful writers involved. Um, Patty Smith has been a long, uh, lifetime friend of mine. She told me right from the get-go, if I ever was to do a book of any sort, that she would uh, love to be involved. So I knew I had her uh, involvement. And subsequently, Adam Gopnik, uh, Andrew Solomon, Francine Prose, and Susan Orlean all um, agreed to do essays. And they were just inspired by the pictures. I didn't give them any parameters. I gave them a sort of a word count and I let them write however they wanted. And I have to say that the, the literary aspect of the book is, adds a wonderful element. Um, and I do hope if you do get the book that you take the time to read them because they're enlightening um, and so different and the way they perceive these photographs. Um, so um, the book is there and um, I do hope you have a chance to look at it at the end. Um, one thing I wanted to say is 20 years ago, I, I don't even think I had a computer at that time. Um, I certainly was shooting film, all of the, and I was shooting a Hasselblad two and a quarter um, camera. And I kept that consistent for the next 20 years. 
Um, I am very much rooted in the analog photography process. That's not to say that some, some things that I am doing now and some things that I will show you later uh, in today's presentation won't include some digital aspects, but all of the images in the book um, and all the portraits were done on two and a quarter film, which gives me sort of a, a reason to show you my workspace. Um, because we're in B and H, I would think I, I put these slides in because I personally um, get a jolt out of seeing other people's workspaces. I love dark rooms. I love seeing other people's dark rooms. Dark rooms are something that perhaps um, is a, a lost art or working in a dark room. Um, like all the other old processes, I think they will always exist. Silver gelatin printing will always exist. But let's face it, it's not what it used to be. Um, I'm very fortunate. I live on the upper end on the west side of Manhattan on an eighth floor in a beautiful large building and this workspace is on the ground level of that building. Um, I spend a lot of time there as you can imagine. The reason I'm showing you this is um, this slide here is because the contact sheets, the proofs, very, very, very important in um, my uh, part of the whole uh, process of doing these photographs. My clients do never see proofs, they never see contacts, and um, I take uh, long, painstaking hours going over them and looking and looking and looking and finding that magical moment that I think represents that child. Um, I'm looking at composure, I'm looking at symmetry, I'm looking at a lot of different things that I think a parent wouldn't look at. So um, I just wanted to indicate that to you. I mean, it's a typical process. You clean the negatives, you put the negative in the enlarger. Um, I'm not always that happy putting the negative in the enlarger, but <laughs> um, you, you focus the negative, and for all of you that have been in dark rooms, uh, you certainly are well aware of this. You burn and you dodge. Um, and then you obviously put the photographic paper into the chemicals, the developer, and wash them, look at them, tone them, dry them, and then this is the last photo, this is the photograph here. So let me just show you a couple of other images from that, this one here, and I'm just going to, uh, in order to keep the, this part brief, I'm going to end it with this one who happens to be my son. Um, my early work, okay, this is really the, the, just, the, the main part of my presentation that I want to do here today. Um, the dates here are from 1982 to 1991. Um, I decided to make it 1982 because I graduated in December of 1981. I didn't want to show you any classwork or student work. Um, and I want to start this with a quote, and it's a quote by Anthony Tomasini, and it's from a New York Times June 1st article. And the article is about Glenn Gould, the incredible pianist. And the first par paragraph goes like this. It says, the first Beethoven sonata I learned as a young pianist was the dr dramatic patatique. When I started working on it, I tried to copy the way the great Rudolf Serkin played Serkin played it on a recording I loved. There is a place for learning by emulating masters, but it can easily become inhibiting. Fairly early on, aspiring musicians must develop their own voices. Now, I would think most of you do know, and for those of you who do not, uh, Robert Maplethorpe <coughs> is my older brother. Uh, when I got out of school, I became his assistant pretty immediately. He hadn't really had an assistant at that time. He was getting busier and needed somebody by his side. So I had a, a great formal training in school. And he hired me somewhat reluctantly, but I would say within the first few months of that relationship, we became very close. We became friends, and we developed a great brother, brotherly relationship and friendship. Um, because I was more trained, uh, he relied on me heavily in the studio. Um, he was working quite successfully with a single light sauce. Uh, it was a mono, mono, mono light. And I suggested we upgrade the studio. So I got more and more equipment, more sophisticated, sophisticated equipment. And um, 
we were on a journey together. I mean, it was a wonderful collaboration. Now, I don't lay claim to any of Robert's photographs, um, but I, uh, but what I wanted to say is, Robert was a master visionary, and that's why this quote really struck me. And he was became a mentor of mine. Um, I would say that Robert wasn't a master photographer because Robert wasn't didn't know how to process a roll of film. He didn't know how to print uh, a negative, but he was a visionary, and it didn't matter how he got the photographs, he got the photographs. So I cherished my relationship with him, and I cherished my time with him, and I cherished what I learned from him, and I believe he cherished what he learned from me. But when, I, when he passed away in 1989, I was asked and approached to start exhibiting my own work. So. I did exhibit these with James Danziger Gallery. His, I think it was his second show in 1990. Um, and here you can see I introduced like hair lights and side lights and things like that. And I think if you look at Robert's photographs during the, the mid to later 80s, you'll see that element in them as well. And I did really quite well with these photographs. And I put this one, this is a very early portrait of um, David LaChapelle, whose work I'm sure you are familiar with. Um, and I did very well with this work some nudes, and this is where I start, I think, getting a little bit more abstract with my work. I think you can start seeing a shift. This is more later 80s, and I'm starting to think in pairs. I'm trying to th think in, in, in diptychs and triptychs. Um, you, know, I, you know, I had taken this photograph of Robert's camera in 1989, just after he passed away, and it wasn't a conscious effort, but a year later, I, I did this picture of the gun with the shoe, and I, I, I saw the relationship with that. Um, but it was around this time that I started to realize that I wanted to be a successful artist in my own right. And in order to do that, I needed to create a voice of my own. And that's why that quote was resonated so well with me. So uh, it, it's a, perhaps a cliche, but I had a dream one night, and it was an underwater dream. And I woke up that morning, and I was like, underwater? Now, I have no affiliation, I mean, I have no drive to, to photograph underwater, but I was just like, I've never seen an artist take a, a medium format camera and go underwater. Um, so I called my assistant, and I said, I have this crazy idea. I said, do you want to learn how to dive, get certified, and start assisting me doing pho photographs underwater. And he jumped on the chance, and we went and got our certification. We went out to Montauk in February and did our first open water dives. You can imagine how cold that was. Um, and then it dawned on me, OK, now I have to find a housing for the, for the camera. Well, long story short is it took some time. And I guess it was a competitor of B&H, Ken Hansen, who I don't think is lo no longer exists. But sure enough, I found a housing. And again, because this is a, a, a photographic crowd, I wanted to show you this piece of equipment because I have to say it's um, one of the finest crafted pieces of equipment I've seen. Um, it's all Carl Zeiss lens, uh, dome ports. It's a Hasselblad. It was made in the 70s, and they just don't make things like that any longer. So we went down, did some dives, and these are some of the images that uh, resulted. Um, I was very adamant about not wanting to shoot color film. I mean, my expertise in my past has always been black and white. So I uh, shot, it was a 70 millimeter. If I can go back to that last one, that's a 70 millimeter back. It's 15 feet of film, so you can get 70 shots on a film because obviously on a roll, obviously when you're 60, 30, 40 feet deep, you can't be changing backs underwater. Um, and well-composed landscapes, that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to take the National Geographic color fundamental aspects of underwater photography out and take an artist's eye. So I started doing these. Now, as the diving became more second nature, because I have to say that I was learning to dive and photograph underwater at the same time. You can imagine those first dives were quite random. But as the diving became more second nature, I was able to 
just stop and look at what I was photographing and maybe stay there and wait until the right angle or the right, the right time that that uh, coral or, uh, was, was in the right position. And um, I'm using strobes too on, the, on, these, on these pictures and able to bracket and things like that. So you can see they become more and more refined over time. Um, and I loved minimalism and I loved the minimal landscapes. So it was, so people would on the, on the boats, on the dive boats would sort of chuckle wondering what I was going down to photograph because there was nothing down there. Um, but I saw something and it was those, those seascapes that I thought were special and they were different and they were certainly mine. And I gotta say, I kept looking at these images and looking at the surface of the water. So this is all to tell you how I sort of progress and my, I'm trying to explain to you how I go from one subject to the next and, um, and, and progress in my thinking. I mean, where I started with the, the portraits and where I, where, I ended, where I end is quite vast, but there's a link on everything. So I started to look at the surfaces of these and I started to photograph them because it was around this time that I started not looking at photographs so much, but I started looking at painting. I started going to museums and I started um, and thinking, uh, and thinking about conceptual work and, and minimalist work. And, um, and I, I kept realizing that this really was speaking to me. So I continued, and this is just some more underwater pictures. This is the bottom of the ocean floor. And there's a line pattern that you see going on here that I think you're gonna see crop up again in later work that I do. Um, here's brain coral. Um, it was probably 40 feet underwater. You probably never know that I was even underwater doing that photograph. But again, there's a line pattern and it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a Keith Haringness to it that I see. So after doing that for a few years, I knew that I was never gonna be just an underwater photographer. I had no desire just to be an underwater photographer. And in fact, I missed the studio. So I wanted to go back to the studio, but I still wanted to work with water as a medium. So I just thought that the best way for me to do that is to work with it in its solid form. So I found somebody who was an ice sculptor and we got these big blocks of ice. We'd set them up in the studio. I would have him cut them. We would chip at them, distress them. We'd have blow torches. And I, could, I realized I could use that as a distortion lens. I mean, I'm, everybody's familiar with Andre Kertes distortions. I was familiar with Ouija's distortions. There is an art historical um, reference being made, but I had now a distortion lens that I could manipulate. Um, and this is one of them. Now, here I am, I'm doing portraits. I'm back in the studio, but these portraits are my portraits. Um, and I think they have my name on them. Um, I, I mean, I, th these images have never really been shown. Um, there's a darkness to them, but I, I, I just love them. This one here, and one thing I can say is it was challenging because every time we did it, every block of ice we used was different. Every time, you know, and you do it at uh, two o'clock, at three o'clock, that ice block has changed. So it was challenging because there were some times that I would really love the quality of a certain block of ice and I wouldn't necessarily be able to get that back the next time. But you would, you'll see Francis Bacon, you'll see um, Salvador Dali, you'll see surrealism in these pictures and more painterly. Um, so now I'm, I'm really using photography as an expression. I'm not just working with a camera. Flowers, it's a subject that I didn't think I would ever be able to approach because my brother's uh, reputation and his, um, and his uh, body of work is rooted in um, taking floral studies. Um, and I decided to start photographing flowers through these blocks of ice. So again, I thought that these I could call my own. Now I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit here because um, there's a lot of bodies of work between 1996 and 2007, and they're worthy of discussion. Um, but 
I want to sort of jump ahead just for, t for time's sakes, really. Um, I was drawing a lot between those years. I was taking a pen and ink to pa paper and doing lots and lots of drawings. And these are some of them, I think. There we go. Um, and I was amassing quite a number of them. And around 2004, I got a phone call from Shiseido, the Japanese cosmetic company, wanting to do a collaboration with me. And they had these garments, and I have to look up his name because uh, Japanese gentleman. His name is Yushi Nagasawa. Um, he was making, making these garments out of human hair. And they asked if I would be interested in doing a collaboration. It certainly intrigued me. I certainly wanted to see um, the garments. And they came over with them. And I said, well, listen. I said, I don't really take that many photographs in a studio any longer. I'm not that interested in really taking pictures of a model with these garments. But I am interested in using my workspace, my darkroom, and leave, having you leave these with me and letting me make some um, photograms. Uh, well, we did do it one day in the studio because it was necessary. But um, uh, the work we did and we showed in, in um, Paris was very successful. I wanted to continue working with hair as a mar ma mark making device, but I wanted something more refined. So. I decided to start working with horsehair. Now, at the same time, I found this book on lith printing. Now, lith printing is just another photographic process. It's another. It's an AB developer. Um, typically, one would overexpose a negative, two or three stops, so it's a heavily overexposed sheet of paper, and the developer is very weak. Um, sometimes you'll have the photographic paper in the developer three, four, five minutes, and nothing is really happening. But then it's called infectious development. It starts coming up, and it starts morphing, and it starts changing. And that's when it's so exciting to see. Obviously, you're in a dark room. I am, have basically no safe light except for a little one on, and I turn it on and off just to see when it's coming up. And then once you have it, you have to snap it and get it in the developer right away. And it's an amazing process. And the tonalities and the colors you get by using this process is quite amazing. This image here is one of those resulting images. Now, again, it's a big jump. But after you know working in, under water and looking at paintings and then doing a lot of drawings myself, um, I found that this was an expression of my own. Um, now, what I did is I just took horse hair. I, it's an 8 by 10 enlarger, which you may have seen in an earlier picture. I take that hair, put it in the enlarger, and enlarge it onto photographic paper. Well, that was all good, but basically you're getting a white line on black photographic paper. And I was like, OK, well, where can I go with that? And I was like, well, I want to have a real line mark making line on the photographic paper. So I started exposing ortho film, 20 by 24 ortho film. So now I'm getting a white line on a black acetate. And then I would contact that. So then I would have a black line on a clear acetate. And then I would have these acetates. And I would be able to put them on the photographic pro um, paper, expose it, get a line, take that out, put another one in, expose it, get another line. So that's where you see all of this layering going on here. Um, these are other examples. I mean, there's uh, here you can see. You can see a white line. You can see a black line. And the colors. I mean, this, the colors, these are black and white photographic papers. <laughs> uh, I did work with toners. Um, I did work with selenium toner and gold toners. Um, but this was becoming my expression, much more of um, painting, I would say, much more drawing than they are uh, pure photographic images. Um, this here happens to be, I guess that was the invitation image um, that we did. This here 
is the same process, and this was just another, um, uh, I would say, uh, natural progression for me. I, I, I liked the motif that I was getting, but I decided what would it be like if I was to move that whatever was in the enlarger. So I built an easel on a Lazy Susan. So while the po paper was being exposed, I was able to rotate the photographic paper. And so those lines would create this pattern. Here's a perfect example of something that is heavily selenium tone. That's giving you the warmth. And the highlights, of course, uh, the gold toner always attacks the highlights first, so that's where you're getting the, the blue tones. Um, the next group of work I want to show you um, is called the variations. And the variations uh, are, are titled that because, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Glenn Gould earlier, um, uh, I just started listening. I discovered him and started listening to the Goldberg ver variations. And everything that I did for this group of work was while I listened to the Goldberg variations, so that's why I titled it that. Um, but I wanted to paint. I wanted to not just draw with the photographic process, but I wanted to paint. And I happened upon an article in a Scientific American magazine, 1991, about chromoscodaskic painting. I never liked that word. <laughs> I don't use that word, but it's the word that these two gentlemen coined who developed and discovered this process. Um, one gentleman, his name is Dominic Mann Kit Lam, and his associate was um, Brian Rossiter. Um, Dominic is a very, very uh, successful uh, scientist and uh, mathematician, and he also has an amazing um, creative side. And he was always wondering why prints that were not, uh, were not um, fixed would start turning colors. So without getting into a long discussion about this, um, he found these chemical processes that would um, create different tones and tonalities in his prints. So I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. Lo and behold, I was able to find the, the chemicals. Um, and this is one of the resulting. So in or, rather than explain to you the process, a, a friend of mine did a short video. So I want to show that to you. So you can see how these are created. Um, how do I do this again, David? There you go. And what I'll do is I will explain to you what's, what, 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 what you're looking at. This is a short introduction, just showing some of the close-ups. This is black and white photographic paper working large scale, we wet the paper, I'm squeezing the water off, and now I'm applying, it's called a stabilizer. I'm using stabilizer uh, right out of the bottle, and this is in, under safe light conditions. I determined that I started wanting to blow, so I started using air guns and, and so I could move the chemicals. Now the lights come on. So now the dark room is really just being my tool. Light goes on, and you have upwards to 20, 30 minutes to work on this piece. So there's no immediate rush. As a matter of fact, I like that stabilizer to remain on the, the, the photographic paper to create that white line. Now here, I'm wor working with developer. This is regular Dectol type developer, and obviously it exposes, you know, it, it activates the, the uh, halides immediately. And what's nice is that you can then rinse these chemicals off and sort of have a, a clean canvas again. So now I can start again. And there's another chemical. One is an activator, one is a stabilizer. One will speed up the process. The other one will slow the process down. I made 10% solutions. I made 20% solutions, 30% solutions. And the interaction of those chemicals with the silver halides in combination with the light is what would create these different tonalities. 
So there's no pigments in any of these chemicals. They're clear chemicals. Um, and it's just the way they change the shape and size of the silver halides in the gelled silver paper, which is where it's light scattering. It's, it's how tonality is, is being um, read by the mind's eye. I came up with spray bottles. I came up with brushes. We came up, I mean, whatever I sort of found was applicable to the, my vision and the way I like to work. Um, And it gets to the point that, you know, you, you're, it slows down, the activation slows down, and it's time to start wrapping it up. I like to put borders on all of the prints, so that's what you're seeing going on now. So I just, I want to show you a few others that we did. Um, I showed these at uh, the Foley Gallery in 2011. Um, each piece is unique, which was another a very attractive thing, as were the lith prints, um, uh, the Timelines series that I showed you. They're all unique. Um, there is no negative. There's no way to reproduce these. Um, some of them are quite large scale. These were th over 30 by, f these are like 50 by 60. Um, a little bit longer, 50 by 70 or so images. And then again, I started liking things in series and I started, um, I didn't create this as a diptych, but I later stepped back and thought, wow, these two pieces really work well together. So I put those together and then subsequently there was another three that I found worked as a series. And now, again, I mean, you don't look at these and think photography, but they are photographs. I mean, very much photographs. Um, but I think they, and I feel like I can say that they're my own. I mean, there's certain influences, um, art historical, Jackson Pollock, is. I always hear the word, uh, his name come up when people look at these, which is great. I mean, it's, um, I'm flattered. <laughs> Um, we are all influenced by everything we look at, everybody we meet. I mean, there's no way around that. And um, pretty much everything has been done these days. So it's a matter of just um, looking, seeing, exploring, trying, uh, failing, and trying again, and picking yourself up and keep experimenting. Um, I wasn't quite done with that process, but uh, the idea of wanting to do multiples was appealing to me. So. I went back into the dark room, did more humble 16 by 20 inch prints, and I went and had them drum scanned. And I did line patterns that I would have drum scanned as well. So I would have more control. So again, I could layer digitally now, we're talking digitally, I could layer um, one line pattern over another. I could invert it, change it. Um, I gotta say the color tonalities, we didn't, I was pretty adamant about not wanting to alter them digitally at all or much at all, I mean. And I wanted to, again, put more of a painterly aspect of it. Uh, Bryce Martin is a, a big influence of mine. I admire his work. Um, and I just started working with monochromatic panels for these pieces. Do you sell these? Yes. Everything is for sale. <laughs> I do sell these, yes. Now again, these are uh, large scale. I mean, the actual single panel pieces are um, 50 by 60. These are pig... Well, these aren't, because I drum scanned the 16 by 20s and created image files. And I had them drum scanned at a very high resolution, knowing that I wanted to make them um, quite big. Um, but it was only in later that I was like, you know, I love the tonalities in these and I want to start, you know, putting another painterly aspect into it. So I started working with these monochromatic panels. And obviously the, the colors that I've chosen is or found within the piece. And that's how I derived with that. Um, this is a piece that I want to talk about because it's currently uh, in a show along with my most latest work in Berlin. Um, and 
I wouldn't probably talk about this piece other than here in B&H because it's, um, it's very rooted in photographic process. Um, being a student of the analog photography and loving the darkroom and working with enlargers and knowing that people don't use enlargers that much anymore, I had this idea of having an enlarger print a picture of itself. That was the concept. It was just an easy concept. Um, so what did I do? I set up a 4x5 camera. This is a horizontal enlarger, as you can see. Um, it just made my life a little bit easier than trying to figure out a way to shoot up into a typical enlarger. Took the 4x5, processed the film, oh, had to light it, <laughs> had to light it. 4x5 film, process it. Now we put that negative into the enlarger. Okay, so now I had this all documented because I wanted to document the process of what I was doing. I mean, that alone is intriguing to me because it's the enlarger basically looking at itself in a mirror. In fact, I flipped the negative so that it was looking at itself in a mirror. And then I was just like, well, what if I inverted that? This is not working. Oh, actually, that's me just to show that I, I am involved in this process. <laughs> what if I flipped that and inverted it? So now I have the negative of the environment and the positive of the photograph uh, of the enlarger on the paper. So that was the resulting image, image that I really set out to do. But I did like that idea of the, working with the positive and negative. So I put those together, and I thought that was interesting. But then I looked back on the images that I had taken uh, documenting the process, and I wanted to make a larger piece. So this is the piece that I ended up doing, and this is the piece that I exhibited in Berlin, or it's currently on exhibit in Berlin. Um, that is a pigment print of the process. It's, there are uh, six 16 by 20 images on a 50 by 60 sheet of paper, and that is the gelatin silver print that the enlarger uh, created of itself. Um, I do really want to jump to the latest group of work, which is called the Cube, which is also, and it's the main part of the exhibit in Berlin right now. But in order to do so, I just have to backstep a little bit and give you um, a group of work titled Time Zones that I did in 2008. Um, when I was a student in Stony Brook, which is where I learned photography, um, uh, I had a visiting professor who had just written a book about the zone system. I had heard about the zone system. I didn't know much about it. Um, but he had just, in 1979, published this book on the zone system. And we were students of 35 millimeter photography, so he came and taught us that. And I was just always intrigued by it. It was not. It ended up not being something that I implemented in my photographic process, but anybody that knows about the zone system will understand the, the, the manner in which to get your middle gray and all the subsequent zones or tones um, is a beautiful exercise. So I wanted to make that into a piece. Now this is zone, this is zone uh, what is that, Z one? three, five, seven, and 10. And what I did is painstakingly um, did eight by 10 negatives of each of the zones and we made 50 by 60 gelatin silver prints and um, that were exhibited in Berlin in 2008 and then subsequently it was exhibited in um, um, Rome, Italy. And I did this installation. Um, that is the nine zones. Now, uh, I would imagine some of you might know the zone system as 10 zones. I was taught nine zones. Nine zones works for me. Um, and that's the accurate nine zones in Sheldon Silver 50 by 60 prints. Now, again, the, it's photography, but this is a conceptual idea that I wanted to do, which leads me to the last group of work, um, and it's called the cube. Um, being intrigued by that group of work, I knew that there was something left unsaid, something I wanted to continue to do. So um, I went back to the negative, which is the Ansel Adams book, and I found a subsequent book 
called uh, Artificial Lighting Photography by Ansel Adams. And I saw this image of a cube, and I was just like, that's beautiful. So I went back into the negative, and sure enough, right there on page 162 are these eight images of a cube. And I looked at that, and I was like, that's going to be my next scoop of work. That's going to be my next show. I was, if you read this, um, uh, the text, Ansel Adam gives you precise instructions on what he is doing, and I followed them to a T. Now, every now and again, we are blessed in meeting somebody who um, uh, you can rely on. And I knew I was going to need an assistance on this, and I knew I was going to need help. Um, I had met a gentleman named Darone Guild uh, a number of years ago, and he went on to, and he is going on to have a quite successful career of his own. Um, through Facebook, I realized that he was a master of lighting, so I contacted him, and I said, Darone, I said, I have this idea, and would you be interested in wanting to collaborate with me? And he jumped at the idea. Um, and I got to say, it was a true collaboration. Um, and I have no problem with that. I collaborated with Roberts. Other people collaborate with their assistants. And we painstakingly did this project together. Um, we, I had a cube built. It's a three-sided cube, because that's all we needed to photograph. I had to figure out a way to mount that cube. So this is what I came up with. I recessed the bottom, because there was a time that I thought that I was going to have to put some sort of uh, uh, stand on the bottom. And we set, set it up in the studio. And there it is. Um, and we followed Ansel Adams' directions to a T. The, the main light that you see behind camera was the main sort of uniform light. And these are all just in, uh, documenting the process. And there's Daron. I think that Daron is, Daron is here. Hi, Daron. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, anyway, these are the images. Um, it's, a, it's a conceptual piece. It's an installation. I mean, you can, we can look at these all individually, but I can tell you that the only variables in these pictures is the lighting. The cube didn't move. The camera didn't move. The, uh, the background we changed from black to white, that did have to change, but um, we followed Ansel Adams' instructions to a T. And he tells you what zones he wants, or tones he wants on one side, and what zones he wants on the top, and how to light it. And it was amazing. And I kept looking at these pictures, and I was worried because they didn't look like photographs at all. They looked like CAD drawings, CAD illustrations from architecturals. Um, and they still do. But I love the, the way they sort of your mind can go in from looking at it from a cube coming out to the corner of a room. And um, I mean, without getting into it, I mean, the, the one on the right, the instructions are that you light the background so that the, the face of the left side of the cube approximates the, the, uh, the tone of the background. So that's what's going on there. This one here is that. The, the right side of the cube sort of is it the same tone as the background, so you start losing the, the, um, the separation there. This one was, it's hard for you to see there, but it was, now I'm getting into my own sort of creative process with it and doing my own thing. So this one is um, just very dark. This is your, th your, your black, your middle gray, and your white. Here you have, um, you're it's just one side of the cube being lit. The cube is there, the top and the other side being lit. Here's the cube, just top lit, front not lit, background lit, and etc. Just the top being lit. And here is the installation. So I mounted lighting the cube, and the text was all part of this show. There's the eight that. Ansel Adams describes in his book. These are six that I exhibited that uh, were just mine. And it's interesting how the floor of the gallery sort of works. <laughs> That's coincidental. 
And I did decide to um, exhibit the cube um, for the very reason that I thought that people might question whether they were really uh, photographs or not. So the cube is part, part of that. As a matter of fact, my teacher who wrote that book, I found him. I don't know how I found him, but I found Joe Salsa. He was living in New York City. He had, he had a long story. He had um, stopped taking photographs. He had stopped um, uh, being involved in photography. He had always had a career as an accountant, um, had some trouble in his life, had some bad health. But he came in, and he, he's scratching his head because he comes from a different school of thought. But he's like, he got his head around, OK, now I understand what you want to do here. And he's like, but you're going about it in the wrong way. And he was an angel who came down to me. And he held my hand in some respect and directed me in the best way to be able to get those 50 by 60 gelatin silver prints accurate. Um, I had lunch with him and, uh, the day or two before that I was going to Berlin to exhibit the work. I came back, and Joe Salsa was gone. Um, he ne I was never able to tell him how it was received. And I just am touched. And I, I dedicate that group of work to him, because if it wasn't for him, I don't think I would ever have done it. Um, and um, I do uh, get a lot of joy knowing that I did get him in his last days back into a dark room. Just the smell of chemicals I could see excited him. Um, so I feel good about that. But I'm very, very sorry that uh, he was never able to, to see the, the resulting installations. Anyway, that's the presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I know it's a lot. It's a lot of information. Um, I hope you uh, I made my point clear uh, as far as my trajectory, how I got from my early work to this later work. Um, and I appreciate the time. I appreciate the questions. And thank you very much. Thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.